Welcome to Mr. E Science Theater Presents Physics with Technology, Useful Equations, Units, and Values. So this is the official equation sheet for the Utah Physics with Technology Precision Exam Skills Test. So I wanted to just look at this equation sheet and perhaps consider some sample questions that might apply to each of these equations. So the first equation we see here is average speed is equal to delta d over delta t. d is distance and t is time. So average speed is distance over time. So the types of problems you can see here, for example, if you were given uh, a car travels 60 miles, so the distance would be 60 miles in three hours. So the time would be three hours. Then the average speed would be distance over time, which would be 60 miles over three hours divide that out, 20 miles per hour would be the average speed. Average velocity is equal to displacement over time. Notice they use the same symbol d or delta d for displacement that they used for distance. So it's important to know the distinction between distance and displacement. So let's take for example, if a car traveled from point A, let's just say point B, and point C. Let's say A to B is 40 miles and B to C is 20 miles. So in this case, for example, in the first example here, uh, the distance of 60 miles, perhaps the car went from A to C. So that would be a distance of 60 miles. But now let's suppose that the car went from A to C and then back to B. So if we go from A to C, to B, we would have traveled, A to C is 40 miles, and then to B, we go back 20 miles. No, let me back up, A to C, try this again. A to C is 60 miles, and then if we go, so from A to C, we've gone 60 miles, then we go back to B, that's an additional 20 miles the other way. So from A to C to B, the distance would be traveled 60 miles, and then an additional 20 miles, so the distance would be 80 miles. If I go from A to C back to B, the displacement is how far I am from where I started. At B, I'm 40 miles from where I started. So the displacement is equal to 40 miles. Now in class, we use the symbol delta x for displacement, the change of position, which is the final position minus the starting position. So it's important to note that on this equation sheet, they use a slightly different symbol, but you can use what we learned in class to make sure that you understand what's going on there. So to find the average velocity, uh, so if we went from A to C to B, and it took us, well, let's just say it took us four hours, right? So A to C, then back to B in four hours. Then the average speed would be distance over time, which is 80 divided by four is 20 miles per hour. Average velocity would be displacement, 40 miles in four hours. Average velocity would be 10 miles per hour. So that's those two equations there, average speed, average velocity. So make sure you know the difference between distance and displacement so that you can find the average speed versus the average velocity. Average acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over the change in time. So for this one, for example, you might see a problem uh, where a car is traveling at 10 meters per second uh, and then hits the gas and gets up to 20 meters per second and it takes five seconds. So here what we have is we have a starting velocity of 10 meters per second and ending velocity of 20 meters per second in a time of five seconds. So our average acceleration is delta V. Now delta means final minus initial. So it's the final velocity minus the initial velocity, that's our delta V, divided by T. That's what that symbol delta V over delta, delta T means. So it's V minus the initial over t, where t is the interval of time over which that's happening. And we can then plug in our numbers. Final velocity is 
20 minus the initial velocity of 10 divided by the time of 5. 20 divided minus 10 is 10. 10 divided by 5 is 2. Notice we have meters per second on top and seconds on the bottom. So meters per second per second, and that we could sometimes we abbreviate that as 2 meters per second squared. That is our average acceleration. Okay. So that takes care of our motion equations. The first three equations here are motion. Just uh, average speed, average velocity, average acceleration. The next several have to do with, with forces. So let me grab a new sheet. The next one is F equals MA. And on the equation sheet, it just says F equals MA. As we learned in class, the force here is really the net force. And you can see that right here, and the key here, it says that F is referring to the net force. So the key here, net force equals mass times acceleration. Mass should always be measured in kilograms, and acceleration in meters per second squared. So some types of problems you might see with this one, you might be given a force diagram with some forces that are labeled, and it might say something like this is uh, 50 newtons, and this is 20 newtons, and the object has a mass of, oh, let's just say five kilograms. So a five kilogram object has these forces acting on it. Uh, what is the net force? So the net force is essentially it's what's left over after things cancel out. Here I've got to the right 50 newtons, to the left 20 newtons. Think of it like a tug of war. The result is these 20 newtons are gonna cancel out 20 newtons the other way and leave us with 30 newtons. So it's just take right minus left, okay? Or think of it as big minus little big minus little, that's our net force. Net force, big minus little. So it's gonna be 50 minus 20, our net force is gonna be 30 newtons. That's our net force. Now, if I wanna know the acceleration, I just plug that into F equals MA. I have F equals MA, or as we learned it, net force equals MA. My net force is this big minus little, 50 minus 20, it's 30, equals the mass, which we said is five, times the acceleration. So here I can just divide by five, I get six meters per second squared is my acceleration. Now as far as the units go, if you use the standard units in your equation, then you shouldn't have to worry about track, keeping track of all the units. Forces should be in newtons, masses in kilograms, accelerations in meters per second squared. So as long as I put newtons in for forces, kilograms in for mass, I'll get meters per second squared as my acceleration unit. So that's how you'll see those simple F equals MA types of problems. The next equation says, W equals mg, and in this case, W is referring to weight. What we have called the force of gravity equals mg. M is the mass in kilograms, and g, you can see here, is the acceleration due to gravity. The acceleration of gravity, now we've always used 10 meters per second squared for that, just makes the math a little bit easier. But if you look on the equation sheet down here, you can see they're using the more precise number of 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? If you do the math with 10 on a multiple choice test, it'll be easy enough, you'll be able to tell what the correct answer needs to be, okay? But 9.8 is the number they use. You can use 10, but just realize it's gonna be slightly different from what you're looking at, but you should still be able to tell. For example, let's take this five kilogram object and see how much it weighs. Five kilograms, times 10 would be 50 newtons, right? But if I do five times 9.8, what do I get? Well, let's just do that real quick. Five times 9.8, push the buttons on my calculator and I get 49 newtons. So you can see on a multiple choice test, if I'm using 10 and I get 50 and I see the choices are like 49 or five or 12 or 16, I can tell that 49 is gonna be the closest one there. So weight, or force of gravity is equal to mass times acceleration of gravity. Now, this is a, a little bit of a confusing point on the equation sheet. Right underneath work, excuse me, right underneath weight equals mg, you see another W formula. Now, the nice thing about this equation sheet is that every time it has an equation, it tells you what each of the symbols represents. So make sure you pay attention to that. So in this next one, W equals FD, the W is work. So in this one, Work equals FD. Now, as we learned it, work is equal to force times distance if the force is constant and the displacement is in the same direction as the applied force. 
You'll notice that there is no cosine of theta or anything on this equation sheet. You will not have to do any trig on, on this test. So work equals force times distance, you'll end up with questions like, if I apply a 200 Newton force and push an object 15 meters, how much work is done? Well, work equals FD, that's just 200 Newtons times 15 meters, that's 3,000 Newton meters or 3,000 joules. Remember, a Newton meter is the same thing as a joule for the units. So that's it, it's just work equals force times distance. The next formula we see on the list is P equals MV. So P equals MV, P is the momentum, M again is the mass in kilograms. Sorry, my right, oh, kind of hard to see that. And V is the velocity. So the types of questions you'll see here, uh, basically they give you a mass, they give you a velocity, find the momentum. So if I have a, a four kilogram watermelon moving at three meters per second, what is the momentum? P equals MV, so it's just gonna be four kilograms times three meters per second is gonna be 12 kilograms meters per second. There's your momentum. Now they could say, for example, uh, suppose a, a baseball has a momentum of five kilogram meters per second and has a mass of 0.15 kilograms, how fast is it moving? Well, again, I could go P equals MV. So five kilogram meters per second equals the mass, which I, oh, sorry, the mass I do know, 0.15 times the velocity, which I don't know. So then I can take five divided by 0.15 and I can get my answer. It's the velocity that baseball to have this momentum, if it has this mass, it would just be 33.3 .3 meters per second. So you can solve momentum equations. That's the momentum equation here. The next three on the list have to do with energy. So we've got kinetic energy, we've got potential energy, uh, notice here, gravitational potential energy, they use PE for the symbol, and then PEEL, which is elastic potential energy. So we've got our three energy equations here. Kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Potential energy of gravity, gravitational potential energy, mgh. And elastic potential energy, or spring potential energy, is one half kx squared. These, the main thing is, make sure you know what each of the symbols mean. The equations work out pretty much the same as how we used them in class. And the idea here is you'll either be calculating the energy of an object. So for example, a 12 kilogram box at the top of a seven meter hill. So here I have a box here at the top of a hill, right? Seven meters, 12 kilograms. Uh, you know, how much potential energy does it have? Well, it's gravitational, so it's gonna be MGH. So it's gonna be 12 kilograms times G. Now again, they're using 9.8 here. You can use 10, it'll come pretty close, or you can use 9.8 and calculate it out, times H, which is seven. And if I do that on my calculator, 12 times 9.8 times seven, I get 823.2. So about 823 joules is gonna be the, the units here. Now, if I did 10, if I did 12 times 10 times seven, I get 840. So it's a little bit different if I use 10. So if G equals 10, I get 840. And if it's 9.8, I get 823.2, which I'd round to 823. Now, a lot of times you will end up with problems like this. They'll say, you know, conservation of energy. So the energy at the top equals the energy at the bottom. So if this box slides down on a frictionless hill, how fast is it moving at the bottom? Then at the top, we have MGH. At the bottom, we have 1 half MV squared. And then I would just plug in the numbers. I already know this is 823. At the bottom, it's gonna be 1 half times the mass times V squared, and I can solve that. So 823, and I times two and divide by 12. Just do a little math here, and I get 137.167 equals V squared. Don't forget here, I gotta square root this thing to get my answer, and I get 11.7 meters per second equals the speed. Then you might say, hey, there's a spring over here. The box is gonna slide up against the spring. If the spring constant is 
250 newtons per meter, then how far will it compress the spring? So here I've got the energy here is equal to the energy. So the energy before the spring is equal to the energy after the spring. The energy before the spring was equal to the energy at the top of the hill, which was 823. I could do MGH again, or I could do 1 half MV squared, but it's, it's going to end up being 823. will equal 1 half KX squared, so that's 1 half times 250 times X squared. So now I can figure out how far it compresses the spring. So I just do a little algebra here. I get 6.58 equals x squared. And again, I got to square root that to get x. So I square root my answer, and I get 2.57 meters is x. That's how far the spring is compressed. So that's an example of how you would use those, those energy equations right here. All right on the kinetic energy, the gravitational potential energy, and the elastic potential energy. So you'll, you'll probably either have to calculate an individual energy using one of these formulas, or do a conservation of energy problem, where you would set the energy at one point in the problem equal to the energy at the other point, plug in the numbers, and solve. The next one is a spring force. It's, it's actually solved, now we learned it as F equals KX, right? Notice that's the same as just K equals F over X. It's the same equation, this is just solved for K. So you might have a problem, like a little room over here, where you have a spring and you're going to put a box on it, a weight on it or something. And so let's just say that uh, the spring, uh, there's a force of 20 newtons and it displaces the spring. That's what X is, is the displacement of the spring. And it displaces the spring by 0.5 meters. And we want to know the spring constant. Well, K equals F divide X. So that's 20 newtons divided by 0.5 meters, which is 40 newtons per meter. And that's going to be spring constant. So using that equation, just solving for spring constant, something like that. The next equation is an efficiency equation. So the percent efficiency is equal to the work output divided by the work input. Okay, so the efficiency So uh, it might be something along the lines of um, I'm, I'm lifting something from the ground to a piano. Let's say I've got a 500 kilogram piano and I want to lift this thing uh, to the third story window. So the height is going to be, so that's going to be a mass of course, the height is going to be, oh, we'll just say 20 meters is how high I need to lift this thing. Okay, And so to do this um, we put in a certain amount of work that we have to, you know, we tie a rope and a pulley system and we apply a force and a distance, right? So, um, so the work that we get out, which is the lifting of the piano, is going to equal MGH because that's the useful work that we're doing. So if I take 500 times 9.8 times 20, I end up with 98,000 joules. That's my output. Now suppose that the work I put in was, uh, let's, you know, we had some pulleys and some ropes, and so if we do force times distance on the pulleys and the ropes, let's just say, you know, without the numbers here, let's just suppose that I put in 150,000 joules of work in order to lift the piano. And so because of the force and the distance, there's friction in the pulley, the stretching of the rope. There's, there's, anyway, it's going to take more work in than I'm going to get useful work out. So to find the efficiency, I'm going to take the work out put. And there's my formula. Work out divided by work in times 100. So the work out divided by work in times 100. So I'm going to take 98,000 divided by 150,000 and then times that by 100. So 98,000 divided by 150,000 is 0.653 times 100 gives me a 65.3% efficiency. That's going to be my efficiency right there. So it's just the work out divided by the work in times 100. And remember the work from the formula sheet here. The work is force times distance. You have a constant force. And there you go. Now we're almost done. We're getting to heat. Q equals mc delta t. So in this formula, Q is the heat transferred, m is the mass, c is specific heat, and t is the temperature. 
The, and delta, remember, means the change. So for example, if I have uh, half a kilogram of water, and that means I've got 500 grams of water. Oh, let's try that again. 500 grams of water, and the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now they'll give you the specific heat if, if they need it, or it could be what you're solving for. So, and let's say we take this water from our initial temperature of say 10 degrees Celsius to a final temperature, say 25 degrees Celsius, and it takes, oh, let's say 20 minutes to do this, right? 20 minutes. So 20 minutes is gonna be times 60 seconds is going to be 1200 seconds, right? So there's our time. Nope, sorry, we don't need that. We're just looking for the uh, heat transferred. So Q equals MC times change in temperature. So that's 500 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius times delta T. Delta T is final minus initial, 25 minus 10 is 15. So there's my heat transferred right there. So do 500 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times 15 degrees Celsius. I'm left with the heat transferred is gonna be 31,380 joules. That's how much heat was transferred uh, to be able to change that temperature of that much water from 10 degrees to 25 degrees Celsius. Now, let's go back to this 20 minutes. Uh, let's keep it. 20 minutes is the same as 1200 seconds. If I want to find the heat flow rate, so the very next equation on here is dealing with the heat flow rate. It's basically just how much heat is transferred divided by the time. So if we transferred 31,380 joules, the heat flow rate, Q with a little dot on top, is just equal to Q divided by T. T in this case is time. And so the heat flow is 31, 380 joules divided by 1200 seconds and I get my heat flow rate then is 26.15 or about 26.2 joules per second. That's my heat flow rate right there. So that's how you do these types of problems. The next, the next equations here have to do with waves. So this stuff is all about heat, it's about waves. We can see these formulas right here. We've got frequency is one over period, and we've got frequency equals number of cycles divided by time. So remember that period is the time it takes for one complete cycle, and so frequency is one over period. So if they give you the frequency, you can find the period. If you could give you the period, you can find the frequency, just use that equation. So this one, frequency equals n over t. This is where you'll see Something, for example, if uh, 12 waves pass in 30 seconds and we want to know the frequency. So I'm going to take the number of cycles or number of waves, number of repetitive motions, in this case, we're talking about waves. So I would take 12 waves. Frequency is number of cycles divided by time. So that's going to be number of cycles is 12, time is 30. And I would do 12 divided by 30 and get my answer for the frequency is 0 0.40, the unit is hertz. Hertz, hertz means waves per second or cycles per second. Now if I wanna find the period, period is one over frequency. I can do that one of two ways. I can take one over 0.4, since I already found the frequency, right? And one over 0.4 is 2.5 seconds. Or I could do this. So the period is one over F, it's just the reciprocal of F, so it's the reciprocal of N over T, so it's just T over N which would be 30 seconds and 12 waves, which again gives me 2.5 seconds per wave. So that's how you do those. Okay, the next two equations are circuits. So the circuits, we've got V equals IR, that's known as Ohm's law, and then P equals IV, which is just the power, electric power in a circuit. So here you might have something where you're dealing with, for example, a series circuit. So let's say R1, R2, and R3. So you'll need to know, for example, finding the equivalent resistance here. In series, I'm just gonna add them all up, right? So if I have, say, a nine volt battery, and 
each of these is a 10 ohm resistor, right? Then I know that the total resistance is 30 ohms and the total voltage is nine volts. And since V equals IR, I know that nine volts equals I times total resistance, which is 30. I divide by 30, nine divided by 30 is 0.3. So 0.30 amps, that's the current. So that's where we do this. Now, if I want to find the power, the power, it's I times V, right? So if I take the current, 0.3 times the voltage, which is nine, I can find the power. 0.3 times nine is 2.7 watts. That's the power. So that's how you do those. So the last equation on here you can see is the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's pretty self-explanatory. If you have a triangle where you know two of the three sides, it's a right triangle. You simply plug into this and you're able to solve. Also on this equation sheet, you can see there is a quantity and what the unit is and the abbreviation. So efficiency is measured as a percentage. Energy is a joule. Force is in newtons. Frequency in hertz. Length in meters. Heat, calories, okay? Now, calorie is also a unit of energy. And it's also a unit of heat because heat is, heat is a form of energy. So you can measure in calories or joules. Um, if we measure heat in calories, let me back up to uh, where we did that specific heat of water. So specific heat of water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. If I were to put that in calories, okay, as it turns out, 4.184 joules equals one calorie. So the specific heat of water and again, they'll give you this kind of stuff, is one calorie per gram degree Celsius. That's the specific heat of water if you want to measure your heat energy in calories. So that takes you pretty much on a quick tour of the types of things that you see on the equation sheet for the physics with technology precision exam test. Um, basically, what you want to do is when you're given something on the test, if you can identify what types of quantities it's talking about, you can usually find which of these equations will apply to it. And then it's just a matter of identifying the thing. So, you know, if, if it involves work and distance, I'm looking on here, oh yeah, here's work and distance in a formula. Yeah, I, the force. So if I'm looking for force, I can take work equals force times distance and solve for force. I plug in the numbers and I can rearrange. So that's the type of thing that you can do to be successful on the physics with technology precision exam. I hope that you found this helpful. If you have any questions, please talk to your teacher.